after two months of protests there, a planned day of rage in Saudi Arabia was somewhat muted. Several hundred people protested in heavily Shiite eastern Saudi Arabia, but a strong police presence prevented demonstrations in the capital, Riyadh. Let's bring in Nazar Al Sayyad. He's chair of the Center for Middle Eastern Studies at the University of California at Berkeley. Professor Al Sayyad, welcome back to Bottom Line. Always good to have you on. Thank you very much, Mark. Professor, as I mentioned, that uh, protest, that planned day of rage in Saudi Arabia was somewhat muted. Was that because of a lack of interest or was that because of the police presence? I, I think in the, the situation in Saudi Arabia particularly deserves some attention. Uh, it is very likely in this case that it was, in fact, uh, two things happening simultaneously. Saudi Arabia is not necessarily a country that has always uh, facilitated the coverage of whatever it is that happens uh, internally. Uh, so even if you look at uh, the, the, the Al Jazeera coups, they have not necessarily been able to even access what is going on in Saudi Arabia. I think that the day of rage in Saudi Arabia has fizzled, partly because the government uh, has announced a very large package of financial aid uh, to, uh, you know, the unemployed in Saudi Arabia, but also partly because the uh, uh, political culture, as we know of it, does not really exist in that country. Right. Professor, uh, give us a little bit of historical context, if you will. The uh, monarchy in Saudi Arabia is Sunni, and some of the opposition is, is Shia, correct? That's absolutely correct. In fact, it's, uh, I think it's very interesting. We were just covering Bahrain earlier, um, and uh, the, the areas in Saudi Arabia where there has been a lot of political protest uh, in recent years, not only just in the past few days, uh, has been the eastern province. The eastern province, uh, particularly the area uh, in which, in fact, the, uh, uh, the, the, the protesters were confronted by the police, is in Qatif. Uh, this is an area that is completely dominated uh, by a Shia population. Uh, the, uh, a ruling monarchy is a Sunni monarchy, uh, and in fact, they have engaged in literally in some kind of a contractual uh, agreements with the Shia population. They have been uh, at times uh, given certain privileges, so on and so forth. But, but but they are definitely a minority within the larger context of Saudi Arabia, despite the fact that they may be a majority within the eastern province. And in, in the eastern Saudi city of Katif, we we did see a, a, a strong uh, police presence, if you will, there to. Try try to quash uh, any demonstrations there and perhaps any thought that maybe this might spread to the capital of Riyadh. Yes, and I, I think that that's the reason that one can actually say that the so-called day of rage in Saudi Arabia, as it was announced, completely fizzled. Uh, I think it fizzled because uh, security presence early on made it very difficult for people to assemble. Uh, freedom of assembly is not necessarily something that is guaranteed in Saudi Arabia. Uh, ironically, in fact, where freedom of assembly would occur, it would always occur uh, on Fridays and particularly uh, around the, the Friday noon prayer. Uh, um, and in this case, it does not seem to have occurred very much. Uh, it could be that people just went to pray and then simply went to their homes after that uh, because the space was heav heavily surveilled or monitored. Or it just could be that many of them do not necessarily feel the same degree of rage right. towards the government as people felt in Tunisia and in Egypt. Professor Al Sayed, what are the social and economic implications of this democratic wave, if you will, spreading to Saudi Arabia, which is the, the world's largest exporter of oil? Yes, I, I think it is really important to take into account here that the West, uh, and in this case I'm talking about Europe um, and the United States specifically, relationship with Saudi Arabia has been basically based on the fact that it is the largest oil producing country uh, in the world, that it has the largest reserve, uh, and that in a sense uh, our dependency on oil is what uh, created a relatively cozy relationship between us uh, and the Saudi monarchy. Um, it is not very likely, however, that the wave of democratization that we see starting in Tunisia, spreading to Egypt, uh, and now to parts of Yemen as well as Libya, uh, although the struggle in Libya is obviously a civil war right now, uh, it is not very likely that that will spread to Saudi Arabia in the same way, partly because the uh, uh, gross national product in Saudi Arabia is very, very high. Um, the uh, per capita income is very high in Saudi Arabia. The government has established uh, tremendous subsidies 
uh, at almost every single level that Saudi citizens benefit from. Mm. Uh, in a sense, you can actually say that the state has made a contract with its citizens that while they may not necessarily have political freedoms, uh, they certainly have a degree of economic prosperity. That right. may not necessarily be the case, however, with everybody. And that's why you see people demonstrating in places in, in, in the eastern province, like Katif, right. because they don't feel they've gotten their fair share of attention. Well, Professor Al Sayyad, in our last minute, how do you how do you balance that? Because if you see a lot of Saudi city and citizens, excuse me, believing that uh, economically they may be doing okay, but in terms of uh, societal norms, that they do not have uh, as much uh, freedoms as you mentioned, freedom of assembly and such as as some other Western nations. How do you balance that? And how does the West, particularly Washington, balance that when you have President Obama calling uh, for democracy to to flourish where it can. Yes. I think that that is the paradox that the United States faces today. Uh, in the past, the United States approach has been to tolerate uh, autocrats and dictators uh, as long as they have maintained certain peace and security within the region and as long as they have cooperated and allowed the United States to maintain its best interest. Uh, that is definitely the case with Saudi Arabia. Although I would definitely have to warn here from making these kinds of comparisons also because Saudi Arabia is a monarchy and monarchies yes. have always been the way things have been in the Middle East. So it is unlikely that the monarchy will be equally shaken, if you will, uh, by these kinds of demonstrations as right. uh, democratic structures that were not actually democratic, but at least had the constitutional uh, structure that allowed for such protests to exist in the first place. All right. Professor Nazir Al Sayed, chair of the Center for Middle Eastern Studies at the University of California, Berkeley. Professor, it's always good to have you on. Thanks so much.